Hi, this is Sue Schmidt, and I want to welcome you today to this Faculty Professional Development Webinar. Our topic today is From Cookbook to Guidebook, Remaking Traditional Biology Labs into Active Inquiry. We're very excited today to have as our speaker Dan Johnson, who is the Core Curriculum Coordinator for Biology for Wake Forest University. I also wanted to mention, before we proceed on to the additional slides, that Dan will also be one of our speakers at the May 15th, 16th Professional Development Faculty Workshop that will take place in Boulder, Colorado. So we're very excited that he will also be joining us at that time and further um, provide us information on the concept of active inquiry labs. A little bit of information about Dan. He, as I mentioned, is the core curriculum coordinator for biology. He's been in that position with Wake Forest since 1998. And also, um, while he was trained as a cardiovascular cell biologist, um, Dan was interested in the in the whole breadth of the biology area. He spent nearly two decades designing, developing, and published inquiry-oriented biology laboratories and other active learning instructional materials. In 2008, he was asked uh, to create a 40 inquiry exercises for the biology lab uh, by the National Science Teachers Association. And that particular publication was used in 2010 as a guide for developing developing the new Advanced Placement Biology Curriculum. Uh, Dan is a senior editor of Tested Studies for Laboratory Teaching, and he's an international open access, that is an international open access journal published by the Association for Biology Laboratory Education. He also, with a group of educators, students, developers, and others, developed an open source resource, uh, which call, is called the BioBook. And that was published in 2011. Uh, their second project, which is called Teaching Genetics with Dogs, was launched in 2012 and uses our familiar pets to teach genetics principles and engage students more deeply. And just as a reminder, this webinar has been funded by the US Department of Labor. And as uh, has been mentioned before, the department makes no guarantees, warranties, or assurances of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the information that's being delivered today. But we do very much appreciate their support financially to be able to make these webinars possible. I'm going to advance to the next slide, which will be Dan's uh, beginning slide, and I will now I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Sue. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So I am going to be talking about uh, the experiences I've had in taking traditional laboratory exercises and turning them into more guided inquiries. Now, those of you who've tried to do this know there's a lot of different ways you can go when you are changing laboratories over. So we're going to be looking at a, a couple different ideas and things that I've developed uh, working with graduate students and faculty here that we know tend to work time and time again. But what I wanted to do before anything was tell you where we're going. Um, I'd like to set the stage right up front with some of the challenges that people have with the process of going into inquiry and then uh, talk about how to get into the right mindset. Then we'll actually look at a lab that is probably in most everyone's list of labs that their students do, but their students wish wasn't, and that's diffusion through a membrane. And we're going to look at how we can change that around. And then after we've actually looked at the lab itself, I'm going to back up, pull behind the, uh, pull the curtain back, and let you see the design strategy that I used. Now, I've got time set at the end for questions and answer, um, uh, question and answer period, but it, please, if you've got questions along the way, either um, speak them in, uh, speak and we'll talk about them live or put them into the chat window and we'll uh, talk about them as we go. Now, one of the things I did do was actually add some sort of pointer icons. Uh, you can see that um, you've got take home points, some general strategies, and also Things that um, I consider just tricks that work well for me. They may not work for everyone, 
but we found seem to be good ideas to keep in mind. Now, the slides that you're seeing right now should be available on the CHEO wiki. Um, and also, we will be revising the slides and including some things from the follow-up from the question and answer. Uh, that will be coming shortly after we finish today. And I also realize that a lot of you are going to be working on labs that are for online use only. But others of you are working in a hybrid format, and some may actually be willing to develop inquiry for live exercises. So what we did was actually mark steps in this process we're going to talk about with a superscript N if they're going to be something for online uh, is going to require some modification. So let me set the stage right up front. When we're thinking about designing an inquiry lab, there are certain barriers that everyone seems to run into right off the bat. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to talk about what I see as the biggest challenges to developing a lab. And once we've gone through those, I think you'll find that your ability to think about how to design them will expand quite a bit. And the three things that I have seen as the hardest in, in my own uh, development was to get into the right mindset for inquiry and to get good, durable ideas. And what I mean by durable, I'll explain in a minute. And also how to make those really hard design decisions. So let's start with how do you even get into the inquiry mindset? First and most important thing is to remember what the main goal of inquiry is. In an inquiry lab, you're wanting students to spend most of their time on autonomous exploration, things that they're going to be doing on their own. Whenever I train graduate students who are used to, many of them have come from laboratories where the instructor would talk for two hours during an active laboratory period, I tell them, think how much you can cover and what you have to leave out in 10 minutes. That's all the time you get to talk. Now, they never get to that, but they do start realizing that there's the students they are working with are going to have to spend more time in their own exploration and one-on-one -on -one activities. They're not going to be spending nearly as much time uh, talking or to their students. The other main goal is to have the activities be as authentic as possible. We want students to be experiencing science the way we experience it within the lab as professionals. Another uh, thing that's going to help in getting the, your mindset is to think about what's different about inquiry. One of the most important things is that the outcome goals are going to be very different. For example, if you were doing a lab on, how, uh, on diversity, in a traditional demonstration lab, you might put out 10 organisms so that students can see the 10 different clades that uh, you want them to know about. But in an inquiry lab, we might ask them to arrange the clades uh, or the organisms into more versus less closely related clades. That's a very different outcome and a very different set of skills. So the process of getting there is going to have to be different. Another element that is going to be very different is assessment. When we talk about assessment in an inquiry environment, it's essentially going on continuously. You're going to be asking questions or creating an environment to ask questions on a very routine basis every few minutes and asking more questions that are going to be open-ended and fewer questions that are going to be restricted and have one specific answer. Two things that are going to be very different um, that are not going to be as important online but are going to be very important when you're working in a live setting is class structure and flow and the general management strategy. Uh, many people are really surprised the first time they walk into an inquiry lab that it's just a low roar, or sometimes not so low. It's actually a very loud place where there's a lot of things going on and an instructor might be moving between groups that are doing very different things. That's normal in inquiry. And a lot of instructors, the first time they see it, are very nervous. But that's actually a good sign. The more students are talking, the more they're interacting with each other, thinking about ideas, getting ideas for how to test the questions they have. 
that also means that instructors can't plan as strict a strategy for the class itself. It's going to flex and move around quite a bit. So they're going to have to be a little more adaptable. One of the ways that I found is very useful in working with faculty that we've trained to an inquiry or working with graduate students is to picture a student coming into a mentored summer research lab experience. What would be the skills that you would expect the student to develop? And how would the student get there? And how would they report their findings? If you imagine the teaching lab as a model for the research experience, you get a better idea of what we should be doing in that classroom environment. Also, don't think about content delivery. The goal of an inquiry lab is not to provide a large amount of content. It is about developing skill sets and thinking skills. So in that regard, you need to think more coaching, not content delivery. A good example uh, would be to sit down and when you're looking at a laboratory, think about creating positive challenges, also identifying the student's weaknesses, and not to exploit them and make them feel bad, but so that we can work with the student and help them correct them. We also want to give students the opportunity to practice what they're doing. So where do you get good ideas for designing a lab? This is where I actually find the greatest challenge um, because we are um, finding problems of good lab models that are going to work well in a variety of settings. Um, we actually bring as many as 400 students through an inquiry lab every semester, and we've got to have a very robust model. So what we have to do is we have to look at everything we have available to us. And I actually find that thinking in terms of what's available in the traditional science catalogs is not really the best way to be uh, getting inspiration. I go to uh, pet stores, hobby and craft stores, hardware stores, uh, looking for any idea that could be used in a different way. And I think you'll see where that's come in whenever you, uh, we actually start talking about the lab that I'm going to show you. I also am a big fan of looking at science news feeds, um, Science Daily, uh, Science Magazine. Those are great places to get ideas. To give you a good example, Sigma Xi, uh, the Scientific Society, has a news feed that I subscribe to. And a few weeks ago, they actually did a story that someone has discovered why prairie dogs do the wave. They actually have a behavior where they will, one will uh, bolt upright and give a yip call, and then it will propagate to the rest of them. And in a colony, it looks like they're all doing the wave. Now, aside from being funny, uh, when you see the videos, it got me thinking about what kind of behavior and what kind of evolutionary pressure would be behind that behavior. And that got me thinking about what organisms would be on campus that we could look for behaviors. And there are a number of different animals that are common on most campuses that could be used for that kind of activity. But rather than create an activity, we ask students to make the observation and make the hypothesis. And that would be the beginning of, a, of an inquiry lab. Um, look, look at um, all the sources you have available is something I would, would tell anybody if they want inspiration. Look for um, the maker movement, which has been uh, also called the hackers movement, uh, building things. Um, there are any number of these groups. Look at catalogs from any number of sources. Um, you'll be amazed at some of the tools that you can find useful that you'll find in catalogs that are not for science. Also look at the citizen science programs. There are hundreds of these across the country looking at any number of different ideas. And these are individuals who've had to create a very active environment for the people they work with. Another group uh, to look at is the students themselves. Ask them for ideas. Very often they're going to tell you what works and doesn't work and what they find interesting. The other thing I find that people are frequently worried about is, am I making a good design decision? 
So when looking in the lab and deciding whether or not to tear it apart, I look very carefully for why it does not work. Why is this lab not a good learning experience for my students? The first thing I look at um, is the actual lab itself, but then I think very carefully about whether or not I'm going to refine what's already there, renovate it, or start over. And that's the one that people are very afraid of, is starting over, uh, especially if they've already partially developed the lab. And that's something I tell people don't be afraid to do, because a good idea may sound great, but when you try and build it up for 100 or 1,000 students, it's not durable. It's not going to allow you to do a lot of different activities, or it's going to be too cost ineffective. So sometimes you have to make that very hard decision of throwing something out. And that's not always a bad thing. So what do I mean by refine, uh, <coughs> excuse me, refine, revise, or restart? There are a lot of good existing inquiry labs already out there. And very often you can take one of those labs and rebuild it to suit your needs. But the challenge of that is that that lab may have certain goals that you don't have. And the lab has been designed with that in mind. So I look at any lab that's already in existence as a bit of a two-edged sword. You have to actually think about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, think about uh, what you're going to have to change and how much you're going to have to change. Renovation. That's what we're going to actually be looking at today. Is a common, it'll be some uh, renovation and some start over. But a traditional cookbook lab very often can be modified to become a very good inquiry lab. The nice part about that is that you can reuse existing equipment, which is going to reduce the cost of making transition. And sometimes even the exercises can be tweaked to be very positive inquiry exercises. The downside is that you are restricted somewhat in your design. And there's also a very big challenge in that if you hand this lab off, that you're going to be having backsliders. It is very easy to look at the lab and say, well, this is not quite working, so let's change this. And you move a little back towards the more traditional lab. And then you move a little farther the next semester. And after three or four semesters, you're back in the original traditional demonstration or cookbook lab. What many people do is just decide to restart. There are fewer design restrictions when you start a lab from scratch. The downside is that you can expect a much longer planning and development cycle. And so in thinking about whether to start over with a lab or look at renovation, I've actually uh, picked up a rule that came from, of all places, the lawn care business. In lawn care, there is a rule that if more than 50% of the grass has been replaced by moss or weeds, don't try and fix it, kill everything, and start over. So the same general idea fits here, that if a lab is uh, going to require extensive revision such that half of it is not going to remain, it's very likely that when you do turn that lab around, you're going to find that the, some of the uh, goals are not going to fit, some of the strategies that uh, getting students to your end goals are not going to fit, and you're going to spend so much time reworking the pieces to fit that it's actually easier to simply start over. So that's a rule of thumb. It's not one that is hard and fast and published anywhere. So I want to pause right here and ask um, Sue if there have been any questions uh, or anything that uh, we need to address before we move on. I haven't seen anything in the chat window, but I do encourage everyone who's participating in this webinar today, um, either you know, as a break takes place, ask Dan your question uh, audio, through the audio ability, or otherwise post it in the chat window, and I'm keeping an eye on that to bring up questions for him to answer. Thanks, Dan, for pausing. Sure. So. Let me show you the original version of diffusion through a membrane. I actually, in preparing for this talk, I looked for how most departments and how most uh, lab manuals recommended teaching diffusion. 
And there were about four different versions. So I picked the one that I found the most traditional, and that was um, creating an artificial cell model using dialysis tubing. Now, if anybody's not familiar with that, it is basically a thin plastic tube that is very stiff, like the plastic wrap on a package of uh, cigarettes um, or the uh, thin saran wrap that you would have on a sandwich from the deli. Students will take a piece of that tubing, tie it, and fill the cell with a solution of glucose, starch, or glucose plus starch. Then they will float it in a solution of Lugol starch indicator. Now, after 20 minutes, what will happen is the water inside this model cell will be black because iodine will have diffused in, interacted with the starch, and created the black, um, black stain. The water outside the cell will still be brown or pale brown, but whenever it's tested using a glucose indicator solution, it will test positive. Then students will report the results. That's a fairly standard lab, can be done in about an hour and a half. Now here's where I see problems with this lab. First, the dialysis tubing itself. It's an unfamiliar material. Students don't know what it is. And they also can't vary its properties. So there's really nothing of gives them any ability to ask questions. The second problem I see is that both of the assays are showing diffusion indirectly. They're not actually seeing the material that is moving. And in addition, the iodine solution that they're using is hazardous. Also, students are reporting on a known outcome. They don't get a chance to actually explore and find out what's happening on their own. This exercise also reinforces a misconception. Students think that we know what an experimental outcome should be. Our hypothesis should always be correct, and that the outcome should be something that we can predict with confidence. And that's a fundamental error in their thinking. And we've reinforced it through all these activities. So in using these demonstrations, they are valuable, but they do reinforce this misconception that an exercise is the same as an experiment. So in, in looking at this lab, what I asked was, where do, the ex where do students experience a positive challenge? Where are they being surprised by what they don't know? and being forced to think about it and exercise their critical thinking? Where do they make their own decisions? And where do they get to discover something that's novel? And it doesn't have to be novel to you and I, but it needs to be something that they can discover that's novel for themselves. So what, so what I did was I thought about how we could reform this. And I came up with one of several possible revision strategies. Now, there's nothing magical about the one I'm going to show you. This is simply one that I found would get me where I wanted to go. What I did was I created a lab that has five stages. There's an initial assessment, an open exploration, an initial report from the group, then the guided inquiry phase, and a final report. Now, this process would have to be modified somewhat for an online or hybrid lab, but I think you'll find that it gives you a lot of flexibility to do a lot of different things. So what would be the initial assessment for this lab? First would be a set of leading questions from the instructor. For an online lab, these could be posted in advance or asked as a, um, a poll. There are any number of ways you could do this. But ask the students what they know about diffusion and how do they know it. A lot of what they know will be based on either practical experience or what they have learned in a class, which they may or may not be bringing forward accurately. But if you ask them how do you know it and show them that you expect evidence, they're going to find that what they think they know may actually be much weaker than they would normally expect or normally believe. Another good tool is asking for an example, but then asking if you give them an example, 
is it an exam is it legitimate or is something else working a good example of this is the exercise where people will put a bottle of ammonia or perfume in one corner of a room and ask how long it takes for someone in the opposite end to smell it. Usually you'll see that students will go march along. You'll see layer after layer of students farther and farther away from the origin of the odor being able to smell it over time. In fact, that's actually not a good demonstration. That is a, because the distance involved would not be appropriate for diffusion. It's actually a better demonstration of the movement of air currents in a large space. So always when you're thinking about assessment, what questions are going to uncover the gaps in a student's knowledge, not just what they know? The next thing you're going to do is give students their first challenge. You're going to ask them to create a novel demo of diffusion and ask them to use any of the materials here in the lab and provide them with a materials list. The goal is for them to explore this on their own. There is going to be no one correct answer. And there is going to be a stage where you'll be able to start um, bringing this together. Now, for an online lab or hybrid, you may give a timeline that students would have uh, to finish. In a live lab, I might give them half an hour to create a demonstration. Um, but the point is that they have a chance to explore early. And then we're going to evaluate how well their thinking is, is demonstrating the activity or the, the, demonstrating the principle. Optional hints. Now, this is not something I would be giving to students. This is the set of of questions that as you're working with students and you find some are struggling, you can ask them these questions to help guide them through the process that they should be following on their own. These are the types of questions that they should be asking. And if they can't get there, and they get most of them, you can provide just the one. I would recommend not giving this immediately. Give students a chance to struggle with the idea before giving them some guidance. This is actually very, it's what we call positive challenge. It's a little difficult. Uh, most of us are comfortable, are more comfortable with giving students answers. But in fact, all the research that's out there says that the students actually learn more when they have a chance to struggle first. Not struggle to the point of failure, but struggle to the point that they feel that they're going to need some assistance. But we have to give them that chance to struggle a little bit. Now, the list of materials that I created for this lab is assuming that this lab would be either a live lab uh, in a physical space or one where students uh, could go out and purchase materials for a lab that they were doing as, say, a web assignment. What I would ask them to do is think about different materials that could diffuse across spaces, and across um, other substances. So I've given a few of them here, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. What will carry the color? What will be the liquid in which we put our soluble material? What will we mimic the cell membrane with? You remember I said I wasn't particularly thrilled with dialysis tubing. And in fact, there are other materials that can serve as the membrane. You can use latex versus nitrile gloves. They do break down um, in solvents and do allow some diffusion. Saran wrap uh, versus plastic sandwich wrap bags, those are different thicknesses. They have very low porosity, but some hydrophobic or oil-based materials will diffuse through those. Newspaper. Newspaper in different numbers of layers creates a semi-permeable membrane. The same thing with coffee filters and paper towels. Um, even uh, materials like house wrap, uh, which is made out of Tyvek, a porous plastic membrane. Some of these materials will allow very rapid diffusion. Others will be very slow. And the point is to let them explore and find out what, what would be the properties and to demonstrate it. What containers would they have available? Here you can be creative. The key is to give students materials that they're familiar with, that they know. 
how are you going to quantify the color differences? Now, I know that the Nanslow Labs will have preset equipment and uh, that students will sign up for. But as I told you at the beginning, the goal of this lab is that we can use it in a variety of settings. Now, I want you to imagine you have students who have access to no equipment whatsoever. How are they going to do color differences? Normally, we would do this on a spectrophotometer. But the human eye can actually detect 250, 250 plus shades of a single color. So if you can use serially dilute stock solutions, you can create a fairly fine grade scale that students can use to look at their materials and actually decide how much material has diffused. Again, these are not the only options. These are just ideas on how you could build a lab that would achieve the goals you want. Now, any lab is also going to have miscellaneous standard supplies. These are the items that you sort of keep around always. And we're always big fans of parafilm and duct tape. So I generally recommend that um, any time you have a lab, you have a fair number of those around. Now, I said that the next step after doing the initial te uh, demo or the initial exploration would be to have a, a set of questions to report back. I recommend using a general question template where you ask the same questions in every lab because that trains students to actually think about the process of what they're doing. So in our case, we ask, what did you do? Why did you do it? What did you see? And how would you interpret it? What does it mean? And then you can add one to two specific questions based on uh, your central goal. Hey, Dan. Dan? Now, from here, <laughs> can yes. I ask you a few questions that have yes. come up on the board? The first question. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. Great. The first question was posed by Gina, and she said that some faculty will argue that students need to develop basic skills before they can use those skills for inquiry. Do you think that's a legitimate concern? How do you respond? How much information, well, I always ask them, how much information does a student need to know before we can ask them to answer a question? The goal is we want students to learn how to think like we do. And the way we think is in questions. We ask questions. We think about the concepts. And if you are not thinking about diffusion in a questioning mindset, you're going to assume certain um, ideas are just received fact. But in, in reality, we should be questioning even those. So I'm, I'm of the mind that there's surprisingly little that students need to know before they can be involved in inquiry. Students ask questions. We all know they ask questions. They're very good at asking what's on the test. And why are they asking that? Because they are asking questions to try and understand what's happening in the world that they experience. So yes, I realize that there are people who say inquiry needs a certain amount of factual background. But my return question is how much background is really necessary to understand fundamental principles. If you start by applying a fundamental principle, immediately you develop a greater understanding of that principle, and you can then use it to accelerate your learning at a later topic. So I'm, a, I'm of a mind of ask questions early, get people involved early. Otherwise, they're going to develop misconceptions, and they're not going to be as capable as a student who has asked questions early. OK, thank you. And Gina? Gina, I hope that, that explains. I mean, I can get up on this soapbox <laughs> Gina, right uh, please post in the chat room if that satisfies your question, or if you have others. Brenda K9, uh, K9. <laughs> Sorry, friend, I always mess your name up, um, your last name, because, yes. Anyway, um, her question is, would this initial inquiry portion be something you would have a student do at home and then bring in class, or does it work better in class? Curious how this works in a setting where you only have, say, two hours once a week in class face to face. I would actually add, this is where you've actually got a very interesting challenge in that you have to decide what's going to work for your students. I designed this out of the idea of being able to do it either as a 
two hour unit one time or do it as two one hours or portions or all of it done independently. This lab actually can be done entirely at home. If you will look at the actual list of materials in the questions, questions can be answered by a group chat. The students have a time to develop their exercise, develop their demonstration, photograph it, send it back in. That is step one of the homework. Then they discuss it in chat, go back and do another inquiry, come back again. The idea is you have to think about it as what can we move where? And the more places that you can move things around, the more modules you have within a, within a lab, the better you have the ability to adjust to what your students need. I hope, I hope Brenda, that answered it. Great. And I just wanted to bring back out the comment that Gina made um, in relationship to your suggestions. She said, the general question template could work very well with little modification in online environment. Great to hear that. Um, Gita is very active in assisting in conversion of classes to online delivery. And she said, I agree about the inquiry. I question the focus of some faculty on the development perfection of manual slides. So that was just uh, a side note. And she said, yep, great answer. Thank you. All right, I will okay. <laughs> uh, get, log off right now and come back in as questions come up. OK. Um, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go fairly quickly through a few slides, because I'm showing you a live lab that is designed, but I want to definitely talk about what we did and how we created it. Um, the lab as I designed it actually has several different options. Depending upon how um, confident your students are in their knowledge and what their background is, you could actually create several different versions of this lab. One of them. Uh, version I saw was that we tell students what the known factors are in, that are affecting diffusion, such as area, concentration gradient, properties, distance, and temperature. If we tell students that, ask them how one fact to pick one factor and determine how it affects the rate of diffusion. Or you could ask students to actually work as a collaborative group to determine which of those factors has the greatest effect. Now, this is a bit of a straw man question because, in fact, depends upon starting conditions on which one is going to have the greatest effect. The point is to get them thinking about the complexity of even something as simple as diffusion. And if we give them a, a complex question that has some some difficulty to it, that actually challenges them to think beyond just memorizing what diffusion is. Now, which of these options is appropriate, you would need to decide based on your audience. And there is an even, <clears throat> excuse me, more advanced version where you could actually ask students to work out the relationship between those factors. Which ones increase diffusion rate, which ones decrease it. And this actually we're asking students to basically work out using experimental evidence the Fick equation, which is a basic principle of physiology. The final reporting is going to be very similar to the general question template. What did you do? Why? What did you see? And how did you interpret it? Again, it's using these repeating strategies to get students to understand the way we think. So that's the exercise. Let me tell you how I actually designed it. The process is actually broken up into three sets of activities. The first is, um, and let me back up and say, this, is, this strategy is really based on Wiggins and Matthijs' backward design model. Uh, there are several authors who have um, described this, but they're the one that most people are comfortable with. Um, and that is to start by setting your goals. And next is to create the path to the central question. Basically, what are the performance goals or the strategy that students will use to get to your end goal? After that, it's does, there is a mix of designing the exercise and IDing the resources and compiling them. And I'll 
walk everyone through that. The last step is to select and create the assessment reporting activities. So for this particular lab, I decided my general goal was I wanted students to be able to say what affects the rate of diffusion. I didn't want them to actually be able to define it because that was an activity that was actually better done in the laboratory, I'm sorry, in the lecture or in a group discussion. Um, then I set what I would uh, expect my basic goals to be. I wanted everyone to be able to describe the molecular process and to be able to describe two factors that would affect diffusion. And here's where I built in, I asked, uh, said, explain how or why diffusion works and how these two things affect their rate. And I said, write or draw. And the reason I put that in is, is because not all students are going to be able to express themselves the same way. If you give options for how they're going to express this, then you give the opportunity for students who have learning differences to be able to come in and be successful. The last key uh, basic requirement was they had to support their explanation with their own data. Now, we can then take it and add, for an advanced class, we could add additional performance goals. And that's what you see when I say we could build the general Fick equation. This is not something I would think would be appropriate for a general biology course. But if you were designing for an upper level course, it might be an appropriate criteria. Now, to get to those goals, you have to find an engaging central question, something that students can actually go explore and play with ideally in as many different ways as possible. You can ask students in your initial evaluation whether or not they know that the rate of diffusion varies. Now, this is something at some point you're going to have to ask for the first time. This would be something that would be in a lead-in evaluation. But once you know that the average student coming into this lab knows that the rate of diffusion is different in different conditions, then you already know that you can take them to which factor is going to affect it most. Now, it's very unlikely that an introductory student is going to know the actual components that affect the rate of diffusion. These are the variables that I have bolted here that are from the Fick equation. These are probably not something they're going to know. But again, you can find that out by your initial evaluation. But once you know, let's say we've discovered that students know rate diffusion varies, but they don't know why. Then we can start using questions to guide their thinking and getting them to think about what could affect diffusion rate. And in doing that, we're going to use repeating, uh, as you saw, the repeating basic templates that build thinking skills. But you also want to mix in a combination of questions that ask direct, what did you see? Very specific reporting. But then also has questions that ask that expects students to think from what they know and think into a broader perspective. And those are divergent questions. And then ask questions that expect them to bring multiple ideas back together. Those are convergent. Also mixed together, uh, one of the problems that we have in designing these um, labs is that you'll have students with different capabilities mixed together. And how do you keep them so they're working together? We do that by mixing individual and collaborative work and building in enforced pauses. Those are a great place where students who are working a little slower can get a nudge that they need to move forward. Um, but also students who have already uh, finished their work can actually assist those who are working a little more slowly and help with near-peer instruction. Also gives you an opportunity to work with the students who are a little faster, give them more advanced uh, expectations, give them an advanced exercise. Um, these um, enforced pauses are also a great way to get students discussing their results, get them talking about their data, and on deciding their next steps. Again, planning, developing the skills that we use as professionals, which are to stop, think about where we are, and then move forward, which is a skill that many of our students are coming in and not very uh, comfortable doing. They're used to working at full speed as hard as they can, as fast as they can, and getting it done, which is a skill that 
that has served them well, but they need to, to learn that there are alternative strategies. Whenever I uh, then start scaffolding the exercise, first thing I asked was, what will be my lead-in evaluation? How will I find out what they know? And you saw how I did, decided to do that with some very basic questions about what do you know about diffusion? And this actually identifies what they already know and gives you a good point of deciding how to move the lab forward. The next decision is what will they do as an exploration? What can they do that they can do a variety of things and they're going to lead them towards that central question? And how are we going to have some kind of reporting to see where people are in the lab process, where the students are, what's their thinking? And in designing that, again, very basic template works. Uh, that template I showed you actually is surprisingly robust to me. It's, it's fundamentally the questions that drive the scientific process. So you can use them in, in any number of different situations. And in thinking about the the interim reporting, the initial reporting from this open phase, you really want to make sure that the results they get are going to tell them something informative and that it is as authentic as possible, that it is something that scientists would be doing. And reporting to a group uh, your results and looking at how they come together, that's, that's a basic skill that scientists use. The next step would be during the guided inquiry. And here you're wanting to give them, again, an authentic question, one that is relevant to the biological processes you want them to know. Now, in some cases, you would want to make the guided inquiry much more open than what I have done. You might want to give them an activity that, <coughs> excuse me, an activity that you have no idea what the outcome is going to be and then give them the opportunity to explore it. But again, you need to know where your population is, and, and you'll find that you can develop a sense of what your students can and cannot do fairly quickly. And again, final step during the guided inquiry is how are they going to report their outcomes? The next step is to actually look at what resources you have. In looking at labs, I have a habit of looking at them as not whole exercises, but as components that I can pull apart. I build my laboratories around small pieces and small components that I can rearrange. Because if you look at how you're going to take an entire exercise from an existing lab and bring it out, it's very rarely going to be useful as is. Um, in a traditional laboratory manual, I would say, less than half of the exercises that are in a traditional cookbook lab are going to be useful in an inquiry lab. It's going to depend upon the author. But in general, I find that most of them will have components that I can use. And in looking for the components, I tend to look for things that are reusable in many different ways. For example, most people, when I say Drosophila, they immediately think genetics. Very few people think hormones and endocrinology. But in fact, we designed the lab looking at the rate of hatching of fruit flies on the basis of what hormones they were exposed to. So we took a model organism that we already had several labs using and took that model and brought it into a completely different course and looked at it in a very different way. Reusable assays, a very useful thing to do is to develop a basic set of assays that you can use over and over and over, basic methods that you use over and over and over. Because that's what we do in a laboratory, in, in a research laboratory. So why are we not teaching students to do the same thing? The other advantage, and this is a very practical one, is that it's going to reduce the cost of the lab. Um, focus on uh, being able to reuse equipment. One of the big challenges people face right now is how much uh, labs are costing. Rather than just cutting a lab out, look at being able to reuse the same materials over and over and over. That's a very powerful way of getting your budget down. Um, when we made the initial switch from cookbook labs 
to inquiry labs when I first came to Wake, we actually cut our budget by about one third in one year. So I can say from experience that this works. Uh, and also, when you're uh, looking for resources, look for what assessments that you can bring in. There may be some assessment questions or assessment tools that you've been using in existing labs that could be useful. Um, I won't talk about this. This is really more of a practical skill of how much material you need to be thinking about and building in. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, but we can definitely, if somebody's interested, we could talk about this. The last thing you need to do is think about your assessment and reporting. The first key is to think about what is going to consolidate students' learning and what is going to match how they would use this material in the real world. The other thing you want to be doing is looking at how you're going to differentiate who has achieved part of the goal versus all the learning goals. This is where um, we're now getting into the idea of, of being able to grade, and that's um, Anybody who's been drawn into one of those debates knows those can go on for quite some time. So I'm not going to um, talk about that, but if somebody wants to talk about that in May when we're together, I would be glad to. Um, these are some examples of the kinds of um, assessment questions I would ask. Um, some of them are going to be just helping students make very clear what they discovered and being able to word it clearly. And that's a, what I call a low stakes exposition. Um, what other factors that might have affected uh, diffusion? That's a good example of a question that asks students to extrapolate. Relationships between factors is a good way of probing their ability to integrate and synthesize ideas. Don't hesitate to ask students to design experiments not to physically do, but to think about. These thought experiments are a great way of testing their ability to take the ideas and apply them in a novel way. Another thing I always suggest people do is invite disagreement. Students learn a lot when they feel comfortable being able to present alternative evidence and that you will accept disagreement. And it doesn't have to be the right answer but we are going to work and find what we all agree is the right answer or the most likely correct answer. And again, this is an authentic activity. This is the way scientists work. So um, just to uh, close out and open up for questions, uh, this new lab is uh, a guided inquiry uh, that has multiple options for implementing it. It's an adaptable design that you can do a lot of different things with. Um, what you're going to finally choose is going to depend upon what your local requirements are and what your, ver your barriers are. If you have students who can't use certain things, that's going to change how you do a lab. But generally think about creating one strategy that has um, many uh, things you can do with it. As I said uh, when I first started talking about it, this is one example of how you could design a lab. There are other ways of doing it. but I always suggest that when you're looking at a guided inquiry to include some initial assessment, to include a chance for students to explore before you give them something that they're going to be evaluated on. And give them multiple opportunities to get feedback on their thinking. This is a very powerful tool that's very well supported by the literature and is very easy to implement um, and a variety of uh, platforms. So at this point, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sue um, and see if we have questions. Have we lost Sue? Sorry, now can you hear me? Have we lost <laughs> Sue? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. You shouldn't have. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, Brenda had responded to your response to her regarding the take-home exercise. And she said that uh, she does that something similar to that as well. She says that students that buy in do really well, uh, but some it's hard to motivate to get them to do it 
on their own. And I think um, maybe you have a, a few nuggets for us, especially Dan, since you have been using inquiry lab activities for a while at Wake Forest. Um, you know, whether it be in the classroom or outside of the classroom, what uh, what do you see in relationship to student motivation? I know we can't make them do things, but has there been a change because... Well, we can, but it's not allowed. Right. <laughs> so can so, you give us some nuggets? <laughs> actually, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's actually surprisingly powerful is to actually ask the students, um, one of the things that we spend so much time doing is evaluating and assessing what students are learning, but we very rarely stop and ask them what they're thinking. And just in terms of, do they find this interesting? Do they find it not? Why do they find it interesting? Why don't they? This is, this is actually getting at their affective domain, and um, this will actually be part of what I talk about in May uh, in our um, morning session. But um, we're actually finding that if you stop and ask students for their input, that is tremendously motivating. And if you ask them, we've actually done this, ask students to help design the lab, design the lab activity. And I uh, know a number of uh, faculty have actually had great success in inviting students who are struggling in the lab to be part of a, an advisory group that meets with the instructor and provides the information on how to improve the course. What you're actually finding, is, what we actually find is that those students often will bring in barriers that we were not aware of. Or they will point out things that we didn't realize that were problems. Or they'll come up with an idea that's actually much more powerful. Now, we can't implement everything they suggest, but if students feel enfranchised who have pulled away, that can be a very powerful tool. And it doesn't take a lot to bring them in. But I'm also going to go out on a limb here and say there are going to be some students who are not going to buy in. And that is a choice they have made. And I don't like to see a student out who is um, not engaged because they are not comfortable. But if a student has made the choice to disengage and it is their choice not because they are facing a barrier, I think sometimes we have to respect that. And the fact that we say, well, they can't disengage means that we're removing their choice to do so. I know that may be unpopular, but Great. Thanks so much, Dan. That, I think that is a great answer. And I, I know that we can all try and try and try, but at some point we have to provide that student with the ability to be accountable and responsible for their actions. So as you said, if we've removed the barriers, then at that point it's, you know, the student has to make that choice. Um, there was another, <coughs> sorry, now I'm doing it. <laughs> there was another question in the chat room, and it kind of follows up on the question that was just placed, but uh, do you have any data on how inquiry-based students fare down the road in follow-up classes? Yes, we actually uh, do have that, and what we're finding is it's, it's not at all um, what you would think. Many, many people think that inquiry labs are going to benefit, um, some people think it will benefit those who are lagging behind but actually hamper those who are able to work on their own. And that's actually not true. What we find is that this inquiry activities where you have students working together actually raises everyone. Students who were struggling actually do better. Students who would have excelled in an individual environment where they would have to simply do the, go through the activities and would be moving on very quickly actually develop a deeper appreciation because they are assisting people who have different mindsets. So we actually find that working in inquiry and working collaboratively gives them a better sense of what science is about. And students, I would say, for every one student we get who says they don't enjoy it, and don't prefer it over traditional labs, we have about nine who say they prefer inquiry labs. 
but we also see that the students' skills develop very quickly. And we actually are looking at that in a very rigorous way, and we will continue to as, as we move into accreditation. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. And with that, we have reached the noon hour here in the mountain time. And so we're going to close this session. I want to thank you very much for your presentation today. And we will also, for those attending, be sending a survey out to you after the session uh, through SurveyMonkey. And we uh, would ask that you respond to the questions in that survey. It always helps us in relationship to the webinars that we're bringing forward now and in the future. So with that, thank you so much, Dan. We really appreciate your time today. And for those thank who Thank you. And um, I was glad to speak. Anybody? Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> no, no problem. I, I, I was just saying, if anybody has questions, uh, my phone and email number uh, address are up here. Um, I'm happy to take questions anytime. Awesome. And as I mentioned, uh, Dan will also be joining us for the Faculty Professional Development Workshop for the CHEO faculty that is taking place on May 15th and 16th in Boulder, Colorado. So with that, um, to exit this software, please remember to click on the X in the right-hand corner of the software to exit. Thanks so much.